So before I get going this morning, I, I want to share a story with you guys, uh, something that happened uh, about a week ago. So I was in Winco, because it's pretty much the best grocery store ever, and I'm standing in line, and I'm paying for my, for my stuff, I'm checking out, you know, and as I pull my wallet open, a $20 bill falls out on the floor. Okay, so I'm reaching down to pick it up, and the lady in the line right behind me stomps her foot on it. And she reached down and picks it up. I'm like, um, I, I just dropped that out of my wallet. <laughs> and she goes, I don't see your name on it. And she sticks it in her pocket. I'm like, seriously? But I'm like, okay, I'm a Christian. I can't, I can't say anything right here that would, uh, you know, completely destroy my witness. And so I was like, all right, whatever. And uh, so I'm kind of still kind of fussing and fuming, and I'm like, Lord, what do I do here? I mean, that's that's not little. That's 20 bucks. I mean, some people can throw that away, but I'm not a overly rich person. So 20 bucks is 20 bucks, you know. And uh, so I'm just praying. I'm like, Lord, just you're going to have to take care of this. So as I'm walking out the door, I'm still kind of talking to God. And I happen to see this lady on her way to her car. And she's carrying three of those um, you know, the fancy cloth uh, shopping bags, you know, not like the plastic ones that I always go for. And as she's walking to her car, I'm kind of following behind, and one of those bags slipped out and landed on the ground. And my mind said, don't do it. <laughs> but I couldn't help myself. So I swooped down and picked up that bag and started walking away. And she said, hey, that's my bag of groceries. I looked it over. I don't see your name on it. <laughs> so, so I get back to my car, and I'm like, well, I might as well see what, you know, what this lady bought. So I open it up, and the entire bag was full of bologna, just like the story I just told you. Uh, so I'm talking today about perspective. Um, that's a fun story to tell because, you know, if people like you, they're like, are you serious? I can't believe that happened to you. I'm so sorry. And then they hate you at the end. It's awesome. It's great. <laughs> Thank you, Dustin. You're my man. So as you guys know, anybody here that doesn't know who I am? Anybody? Good, because introductions are torturous. But I am the worship director here at FLFC, and I don't speak very often. Um, there's a reason for that. Uh, this is not my strength. If you really know me well, you know that this is uh, not very comfortable for me to be up here. Music is my passion, and speaking is kind of an occupational hazard. So today I'm just going to tell you some stories and read some scripture. And then um, hopefully you'll feel some challenge in your life this morning. <laughs> no more baloney, I promise. So the title of today's message is Spy versus Spy, and it's all about the power of perspective. Uh, when Pastor came to ask me if I would speak today, I could tell from the look on his face that he was ready to, you know, he had to convince me that this was the right thing to do and and, uh, but God had already been laying something on my heart for a while. And so my answer was just, yeah, I'll do it. And, um, that probably surprised him more than it did me, but, but God has been laying this on my heart for a while. So I just wanted to talk to you guys about spies. Now, how many of you guys remember the spy versus spy comic? Yeah. Yeah. One guy all in white. One's all in black, and their only goal in life is to completely destroy the other one. And I noticed when I was, when I was reading those comics that all of their schemes, usually, usually there was some kind of trickery or uh, deception that they, would that they would put into place. You know, they'd plant a bomb inside of a birthday cake or, you know, make a trap inside of a room that looks completely safe. And... When I was watching that, I was never really surprised when the cake blew up or the trap was sprung because 
I had been watching what the other spy had done, so I already knew it was there. So from the spy's perspective, that was a perfectly safe birthday cake. From my perspective, I knew that it was about to explode in his face, which was, of course, funny. But in watching that, it gives, it gives you kind of a, an overview of what I'm talking about tonight, and that is the power of perspective. What you can see is not always the whole story. And so uh, before I get going, I'm going to pray for the message real quick. So if you guys just want to pray with me. Father, we thank you for this message that you've laid on my heart. Lord, I pray that your words will come out loud and clear and that there won't be any confusion and that will go away changed, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Numbers chapter 13, we read a very interesting story about another group of spies. So let's go ahead and let's read, starting at verse 1. It says, The Lord now said to Moses, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the twelve ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out twelve men all tribal leaders of Israel from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. So at this point in Israel's history, they were just released from Egypt. They had traveled across the wilderness to get to the land of Canaan, which is where God had promised them that they would have their ancestral home. They had just seen miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle that brought them to this point. And now they're standing outside of the land that God had promised them. You can imagine there must have been a whole lot of excitement in the camp at that point. It's, hey, we're almost there. We're so close. And so now we're going to send out spies to go check it out. Let's go check out this land that God has given us. So these guys went out and they went through all the land and checked it out. And the Bible describes it as a land flowing with milk and honey. So basically, there was a lot of goats and bees. But they also found that it was a very fruitful land. And in fact, they found, this is cool. This is is in the Bible, so this is cool stuff. They found a cluster of grapes that was so big, it took two men to carry it back. It's like, I love grapes. I want to see a cluster that's so big that it would take two of us to haul around. Okay, but they saw all of this goodness, but they also saw a lot of towns that were very big with high walls, and they saw that the people there were not just ordinary, everyday people. They were very, very big people. They described them as giants. So let's pick up in verse 27. It says, This was their report to Moses, that we entered the land you sent us to explore, And it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. There's those goats and bees again. And here's the kind of fruit that it produces. But the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. And then moving on to the second half of verse 31, it says, We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. There are even giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they think too. So that's, that report scared the Israelites, and they made the decision, okay, we can't go in there. Because we're scared of these big cities. We're scared of these giants. We can't make it. But there were two of the 12 men. A man named Joshua and a man named Caleb. There was nothing special about these guys. They were just two men chosen from their tribes to go scout out the land. And they had seen exactly the same things, exactly the same cities, exactly the same people that the rest of them had seen. But listen to what they said. In Numbers 14, starting at verse 6, two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. 
in Scripture, when you read about someone tearing their clothing, that's, that's a sign of deep mourning and grief. And they said to the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It's a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection. But the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. So what is it that they had seen that the others hadn't seen? They had all gone to the same places. They'd all seen exactly the same things. And the other ten spies, all they had seen is giant people and cities that were big. Joshua and Caleb saw a God who was bigger. They saw the word of God and the promises of God as bigger than the walls and the giants because they had a different perspective. They were seeing things through God's eyes. Another story we can read about is in Judges chapter 6. <laughs> it's about this guy that I really like because he reminds me a lot about, of myself. Um, he's, when we meet him in Scripture, in Judges 6, he's so scared that he's threshing wheat in the bottom of a wine press so that he can hide from the Midianites. Okay? And at this point in Israel, the Midianites had taken over all of Israel. And the reason that he was hiding was because they were stealing all of their crops, all of their food, and the people were starving. So he's sitting here in this wine press, threshing grain, trying to hide it. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And listen to how he greets Gideon. So here's this guy hiding in the wine press. The angel of the Lord comes to him and he says, in verse 12, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And he goes on to tell Gideon that he's sending him out to destroy the Midianites. Gideon's response, this is this is what reminds me a lot of myself. He says, Lord, how am I going to do that? See, I'm from the tribe of Manasseh, not Judah or Levi or one of the important tribes. Not only that, my clan is the least in the tribe of Manasseh. And I'm the least in my family. I mean, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel here. I mean, I was always picked last at recess. I'm not your guy. I mean, right now, I am cowering in a wine press trying to hide. But listen to how the Lord responds in verse 16. And this is key. He said, I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting one man. Now, you know the story. Gideon puts a fleece before God, and he really, really wants to make sure that God is in this. And what's awesome about that is God never gets mad at him for saying, are you sure? Are you really sure? In fact, the last thing he does when, he, when his entire army is cut from 32,000 men down to 300, he's still saying, okay, God, if you're in this, I'm in it. But can you give me one more little piece of information? Can I, I really need to know you're in this. I mean, I'm willing to do it, but I, I really need to know you're there. So God sends him down as a spy to the enemy's camp. So he goes down there with his servant. And they hear a dream that God has sent to one of the Midianites. And that dream tells him, yes, God is in this. We're going to make it. And I won't tell you the whole story because you all know what happened. Those 300 men, when they broke their pitchers and, and blew their trumpets, scared the daylights out of the Midianites, and they destroyed each other trying to get out of that camp. God was with him. 
It's impossible from Gideon's point of view. But God had a different perspective. And when Gideon saw it through God's eyes, he was able to overcome. And there's so many other examples in Scripture. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we read one of the funniest stories ever about Elisha and the king of Aram. See, the nation of Aram was at war with Israel. And the king of Aram would get his soldiers together. And he's like, all right, we're going to go over here and we're going to attack and we're going to destroy the king of Israel. And then God would tell Elisha. Elisha would tell the king of Israel. And they wouldn't go there. So after a while, (laughs) the king of Aram was getting pretty upset. He's like, all right, we have a traitor here. Somebody is telling the king of Israel everything I do. And they said, "Um, actually, there's a guy named Elisha who's a prophet of God, and he's the one who's telling everything that we're doing. So the king of Aram said, well, go find him. They said, well, we know where he is. He's in a little town called Dothan. He said, all right, let's go wipe him out. So he sent enough soldiers and horses and chariots to surround the city. Now, when Elisha's servant woke up in the morning, he looks out the window. The entire city is surrounded by enemy soldiers. So he goes running into Elisha. Elisha, we're in trouble, man. Look at, we are surrounded completely. Elisha looks out the window. Eh. The servant says, dude, put your glasses on. Look out the window. Elisha says, it's not that big a deal. There's way more on our side than there is on theirs. So I can imagine Elisha's servant's like, all right, goes up on the roof. Okay, they got 13,487. You and me. Is that new math? So Elisha prays and says, God, open his eyes. And he was given Elisha's perspective. He looked out and surrounding the army was God's army with chariots of fire and angels. It's it's a different perspective. And here's one of my favorites, David and Goliath. Everybody knows the story. I'm not going to bore you with it. But all of the Israelites were looking at Goliath and saying, he's so big, we can never kill him. And David looked at him and said, oh, he's so big, I can't miss (laughs) <laughs> see it's that different perspective so how does ins- perspective influence our lives it's as simple as this your perspective dictates your perceptions and your actions so let me give some more modern examples of this um, everyone knows the story of the hiding place it's about the ten boom family living in Holland during World War II. They were, uh, they're well known now because during World War II, they saved over 800 Jews by uh, providing a place for them and helping to smuggle them out of the country. But as often happens in situations like that, the enemy found out and they came and arrested the entire family. The two sisters, Betsy and Corey, were sent to a concentration camp called Ravensbrück. It's a horrible place. And there they were thrown into a bunkhouse that was way overcrowded and completely infested with fleas. Corey was complaining about their situation, about their circumstances. And Betsy reminded her of 1 Thessalonians 5.18. And it says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So 
Betsy said, you know what? We need to thank God for all of this, even the fleas. <laughs> and it was tough for Corey because it was uncomfortable. It was frightening. It was painful. They had no idea where the rest of their family were. It was just the two of them. But they had smuggled a Bible into the camp. And every day they would gather the ladies around them and they would read from this scripture. And it would give them hope and comfort. And they were able to minister to the other ladies in this camp. And what's interesting is they were able to do this the entire time that they were there even though the guards would raid all of the bunkhouses periodically looking for things like this. But what's interesting is they never, ever, the whole time they were there, raided their bunkhouse. <laughs> they found out it was because of the fleas. The guards were so scared of getting the fleas that they left them alone and they were able to minister the entire time that they were there. Listen to this quote by Corey Ten Boom. I love this. It's, God doesn't have problems. He has plans. It's a different perspective. Let me give you one more. This is, about, this is for you sports fans. Anybody like baseball? Doug? <laughs> it's Earl Weaver. He was the former manager of the Baltimore Orioles. And for one season, he got to work with a guy that you may have heard of. His name is Reggie Jackson. Uh, Weaver had a, an interesting rule. He told all of his players, nobody steals a base unless I give you the steal sign. Just have no idea what the steal sign was. It was probably like, pick your nose, grab your hat, you know, whatever. But that was, that was his rule. Now, Jackson was a very good ball player. And he, said, he thought to himself, you know what? I know when I can steal a base. I don't need somebody telling me that I can steal a base. I can read the pitcher and the catcher. I know who I can steal from. So one game he decided, I'm not going to wait. I got the opening. I'm going. So he did. And you know what? He made it. He stole the base. He's pretty proud of himself for being smarter than his manager, until his manager pulled him aside. And he explained why he hadn't given him the steal sign, even though he knew just as well as Jackson did, yeah, you're perfectly capable of stealing that base. But you see, the next batter in line was Lee May, who was the second best power hitter. And when Jackson stole second, that left first wide open. So the pitcher walked Lee May took the bat out of his hands. The next batter wasn't strong against the pitcher, so then Weaver had to send in a pinch hitter to try to get the guys home, which left him with a weak bench later on. See, the problem was Jackson only saw his ability to beat the pitcher and the catcher. Weaver was watching the whole game. So our lives are like that, too. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. So the power of perspective has on our lives is most e easily demonstrated in the words that we use. And too many times, those words are a reflection of our insecurities and deep wounds that we've held on to. In my own life growing up, the words that would describe my perspective of myself were things like, not good enough. Second rate, loser, and unusable. And I would love to stand here and tell you that I've completely overcome that perspective, but 
<laughs> As I was preparing this message, my wonderful wife gave me some words of encouragement, and I just chuckled and shook my head. She said, you know what, you're going to do a great job. I was like, eh. hmm. <laughs> And so she grabbed my shoulders, and, and she said, oh, no, you don't. You're speaking about trusting God in his perspective. You need to have God's perspective on your ability to speak. <laughs> So God is still working on me, guys. And I know he wants to do some work in some of you guys this morning, too. I'm going to read a list, and I want you guys to listen carefully because I'm going to ask for a response later. I want you to listen for keywords that may strike you as something that you have labeled yourself with, right? I am ugly. I am useless. I'm hopelessly addicted. I'm unable to be a witness. I'm invisible to God. I am unable to forgive. I am unforgivable. I am bitterness. I am worry. I am fear. I am disobedience. I am a glutton, unhealthy, irresponsible, lazy. I'm a cheater. I'm a liar. I am envy. I am selfish. I'm a horrible parent. I'm a horrible child. I'm dishonorable. I'm worthless. So how many of you felt a little twinge when I said some of those words? Maybe it was more than a twinge. Maybe some of you have felt that way your entire life. Maybe it was from words spoken over you by a parent or your boss, or the kids you went to school with, maybe even your spouse. The words that were spoken so often and with so much impact, they just stayed with you. Even though you might try to hide it as part of your, it's still your perspective. there's other words that I didn't mention but there's those negative things that are inside your heart and life that you've labeled yourself with these things and our perspective can and does affect the way that we see ourselves and it affects our behavior we tend to say things like well I'm just a worrier that's just what I do you know that's just the way I am and there's a trend in the world today that Whatever impulses or desires that I have, whatever feelings I have, that's just who I am. It's a part of who I am. I'm just supposed to follow my heart. Some even go to so far as to say, well, this is how God made me. What does God have to say about following our hearts? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The human heart is the most deceitful. Desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So, from God's perspective, following your heart will lead you astray. And listen very closely God does not and will never create desires in you that contradict His word. Those things that you have spoken and others have spoken into your life, those are lies and deceptions that are intended to keep you from being an effective part of God's will. But let me tell you something exciting this morning. Jesus Christ died to set you free from that. 
I'm going to ask the prayer team to come back up here this morning because I think there's some people in here that need to be set free from labels in your life. If one of those words resonated with you this morning is something that you have not overcome, I want you to come up here and ask these guys to pray with you that that will be broken this morning. So even right now as I speak, go ahead and come forward and have someone pray with you. But while you do that, I'm going to speak the words of God's life and truth. And I want you to receive it this morning. Hold on to it. Let it change your perspective. So come right now as we continue to, to speak. Let them pray for you. Let him break the chains this morning. You are not ugly. You are made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27. You are not useless. You are ready for every good work. 2 Timothy 2.21. You can overcome addiction because he has provided a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10.13. You can be a witness through God's Spirit. Luke 12, 12. You're not invisible. You're seen by God. Psalms 139. You can forgive. He will make a way. Colossians 3, 13. You can let go because you are forgiven. Psalms 103, 10 through 12. You don't have to live with bitterness. You can choose his love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 6. You can let go of worry by placing your trust in God. John 16, 33. You have nothing to fear, for you are not alone. Joshua 1, 9. You can walk in obedience by learning God's word. have to be a glutton or unhealthy, irresponsible or lazy because you are the recipient of a spirit of self-control. 2 Timothy 1.7 You never have to cheat again and you can let go of lies. You can be honest and hate deceit. Proverbs 13.5 No longer a thief. You can work to share with others. Ephesians 4.28 let go of envy and selfishness, putting others first, Philippians 2.3. You can be a better parent, teaching your kids about God and his perspective, Proverbs 22.6. You can learn to honor your parents, Exodus 20.12. You can give God honor by how you live, John 12.26. You are not worthless. Jesus, the creator of everything, died for you because you are worth it. John 3.16 It all comes down to this. Will we continue to view ourselves from the perspective of the ten spies who could only see giants and walls cities? Or are we going to be like Joshua and Caleb and choose to embrace God's perspective on who we are? It's all in there. If you have a negative perspective on yourself, dig into God's word. Find his perspective on your situation. Believe it. Trust it. Own it. We need to speak words of life over ourselves, over our spouse, over our kids, our parents, our friends. We should be known as the people who speak life 